Okay, my name is Pauline Lewis, and I've been at Gallery since 1969. Seen a lot of changes, had a lot of fun with the women's groups, different groups, and um, if you haven't been there, come and join us. Hi, I'm Janice Thompson. I came to Galilee 10 years ago, and then before that, I was actually in the women's Bible study for about five or six years before I actually joined Galilee. Um, I'm in the LWML women's group. Um, when I first came aboard, I was lay ministry, and then I got out of that, and I put my hands in a lot of little things when they need me. Great place to be. Um, love the um, 1045 service with Rob, who does our um, worship. So if you need a great church to come to, this is the place to be. We would love to have you. We'd like to say a prayer today, okay? Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to free us from our enslavement to sin. Help us to abide in your word and bring others by your Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, so that every nation, tribe, language, and people will know the saving power of Christ and his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
first reading, which is Revelation um, 14, verses 6 through 7. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next reading is from Romans chapter 3, 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Our last reading is from Matthew 11, verses 12 through 19. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, it he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to all what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came either eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her her deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. God. You did an awesome job. Thank you to Miss Pauline and Miss Janice for leading us in our worship at home this evening. It was a pleasure joining you in your home today. Pauline, you have a beautiful, beautiful home, and we had a lot of laughter and fun. If anyone else wants to join us for Worship at Home, please email this email link below. Hopefully, Chris will add it, and uh, let me know, or else you can be voluntold by Miss Paula Ellison, or let Mr. Chris Carver know. And on that, I want to say thank you, Mr. Chris Carver, for being our production manager, putting all of this together, as well as uh, sharing wonderful messages each week. And last but not least, our amazing golly singers and musicians who provide such wonderful music not only here on our Wednesdays, but also on our weekend services. Now, throughout our worship at home, we always have a couple of readings from God's Word, as well as a catechism reading. Many of you are familiar with the small catechism. Some of you know there's a large catechism. Luther had a reason for why he gave a small catechism to the people to learn. It's meant to be taught as a head of household to the rest of the family. I want to share with you tonight, as our catechism reading, the preface to the small catechism. It is lengthy, uh, understand this, about 15 paragraphs, and has some very colorful language. But it helps you understand why Martin Luther penned it as he did, and the intent that he has, and why we use it in our worship, we use it in our confirmation, we use it in our studies, because it is dire importance. So here now, the preface to Luther's small catechism. Martin Luther, to all faithful and godly pastors and preachers, grace, mercy, and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. The deplorable and miserable condition, which I discovered lately when I too was a visitor, has forced and urged me to prepare this catechism of Christian doctrine in this small, plain, simple form. Mercy, good God, 
what manifold misery I beheld. The common people, especially in the villages, have no knowledge whatever of Christian doctrine. And alas, many pastors are altogether incapable and incompetent to teach. Nevertheless, all maintain that they are Christians, have been baptized and received the holy sacraments, yet they cannot recite either the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, or the Ten Commandments. They live like dumb brutes or irrational hogs, and yet now that the gospel has come, they nicely learn to abuse all liberty like experts. O oh, ye bishops, that will, what will you ever answer to Christ for having so shamefully neglected the people and never for a moment discharged your office? May all misfortune flee you. You command the sacrament in one form and insist on your own human laws. And yet at the same time, you do not care in the least whether the people know the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments, or any part of the Word of God. Woe, woe, woe unto you forever. Therefore, I entreat you for all for God's sake, my dear sirs and brethren, who are pastors or preachers, to, vote, to devote yourselves heartily to your office, to have pity on the people who are entrusted to you, and to help us inculcate the catechism upon the people, and especially upon the young. And let those who cannot do better take these tables and forms and impress them word for word on the people as follows. In the first place, let the preacher above all be careful to avoid many forms of or various texts and forms of the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Sacraments, etc. But choose one form to which he adheres and which he inculcates all the time, year after year. For young and simple people must be taught by uniform, settled text and forms. Otherwise, they easily become confused. When the teacher today teaches them thus, and a year some other way, as if he wished to make improvements, and thus all effort and labor is lost. Also, our blessed fathers understood this well, for they all use the same form of the Lord's Prayer, the Creed and the Ten Commandments. Therefore, we too should teach the young and simple people these parts in such a way as not to change a syllable or set them forth and repeat them one year differently than in another. Hence, choose whatever form you please and adhere to it forever. But when you preach in the presence of a learned and intelligent man, well, you may exhibit your skill and may present these parts in as varied and intricate ways and give them as masterly turns as you are able. But with the young people, stick to one fixed permanent form and manner and teach them, first of all, these parts, namely the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, etc., according to the text, word for word, so they too can repeat it in the same manner after you and commit it to memory. But those who are unwilling to learn it should be told that they deny Christ and are no Christians. Neither should they be admitted to the sacrament, accepted as sponsors at baptism, nor exercise any part of Christian liberty, but should simply be turned back to the Pope and his officials, yea, to the devil himself. Moreover, their parents and employers should refuse them food and drink, and they notify them that the prince will drive such rude people from the country, or etc. For although we cannot and should not force anyone to believe, yet we should insist and urge all people that they should know what is right and wrong among those among whom they dwell and wish to make their living. For whoever desires to reside in a town must know and observe the town laws, the protection of which he wishes to enjoy, no matter whether he is a believer or at heart or in private, a rogue or knave. In the second place, after they have learned well the text, then teach them the sense also, that they know what it means, and again choose the form of these tables or some other brief uniform method, whichever you like, and adhere to it, and do not change a syllable as was just said regarding the text, and take your time to do it. For it is not necessary that you take up all the parts at once, but one after the other. After they understand the first commandment well, then take up the second, and so on. Otherwise, they will be overwhelmed, so as not to be able to retain any well. In the third place, after you have thus taught them this short catechism, then take up the large catechism, and give them also a richer and fuller knowledge. Here explain at large every commandment, petition, 
and part in its various works, uses, benefits, dangers, and injuries, as you find these abundantly stated in many books written about on these matters, and particularly urge the commandment or part most which suffers the greatest neglect among your people. For instance, the seventh commandment concerning stealing must be strenuously urged among mechanics and merchants and even farmers and servants, for among these people many kinds of dishonesty and thieving prevail. So too you must urge well the fourth commandment among the children and the common people, that they may be quiet and faithful, obedient and peaceable. And you must always adduce many examples from the scriptures to show how God has punished or blessed such persons. Especially should you here urge magistrates and parents to rule well and to send their children to school, showing them why it is their duty to do this. And what a damnable sin they are committing if they do not do it. For by such neglect, they overthrow and destroy both the kingdom of God and that of the world, acting as the worst enemies, both of God and men. And make it very plain to them what an awful harm they are doing if they will not help to train their children to be pastors, preachers, clerks, etc. And that God will punish them terribly for it. For such preaching is needed. Parents and magistrates are now sinning unspeakably in this respect. The devil too aims at something cruel because of these things. Lastly, since the tyranny of the Pope has been abolished, people are no longer willingly to go to the sacrament and despise it. Here again, urging is necessary. However, with this understanding, we are to force no one to believe or to receive the sacrament, nor fix any law, nor time, nor place for it, but are to preach in such a manner that of their own accord, without our law, they will urge themselves and, as it were, compel us pastors to administer the sacrament. This is done by telling them, whoever does not seek or desire the sacrament at least some four times a year, it is to be feared that he despises the sacrament and is no Christian, just as he is no Christian who does not believe or hear the gospel. For Christ did not say, this omit, or this despise, but this do ye as often as ye drink it. Verily, he wants it done, and not entirely neglected and despised. This do ye, he says. Now, whoever does not highly value the sacrament, thereby shows that, it has, that he has no sin, no flesh, no devil, no world, no death, no danger, no hell. That is, he does not believe any such things, although he is in them over head and ears and doubly his devil's own. On the other hand, he needs no grace, life, paradise, heaven, Christ, God, nor any good. For if he believed that he had such so much that is evil and needed so much that is good, he would thus not neglect the sacrament by which such evil is remedied and so much good is bestowed. Neither will it be necessary to force him to the sacrament by any law, but he will come running and racing of his own accord, will force himself and urge you that you must give him the sacrament. Hence, you must not make any law in this matter as the Pope does, only set forth clearly the benefit and harm, the need and use, the danger and the blessing connected with this sacrament. And the people will come of themselves without your compulsion. But if you do not come, if they do not come, let them go and tell them that such belong the devil and do not regard nor feel their great need and the gracious help of God. But if you do not urge this or make a law or a bane of it, it is your fault if they despise the sacrament. How could they be otherwise than slothful if you sleep and are silent? Therefore, look to it, ye pastors and preachers. Our office has now become a different thing from what it was under the Pope. It has now become a serious and salutary. Accordingly, it now involves much more trouble and labor, danger and trials, and in addition to, thereto, little reward and gratitude in the world. But Christ himself will be our reward if we labor faithfully. To this end, may the Father of all grace help us, to whom we praise and thanks forever through Christ our Lord. Amen. Here ends Luther's small catechism. Take it away, Chris. Thank you to Miss Pauline and Miss Janice for hosting this week's Wednesday Worship at Home. 
and bringing it to your love from your lovely house, Miss Pauline. Uh, as always, the Galilee Singers for our beautiful hymn tonight in uh, honoring Dr. Martin Luther as we begin Reformation Week in Weekend. And last but not least, Pastor Matt for our catechism lesson from the preface of the small catechism, where we learn from Dr. Luther to have pity on the people who are entrusted to you and to help us inculcate the catechism upon the people, especially upon the young and the young at heart. Before we dive into tonight's message, let's join together in a brief time of prayer. Heavenly Father, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and of peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to the one true saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lips, and from the lips to the life that as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So when I started to look at this week's text, the thought of thoughts of literary image that were provoked in my imagination were this. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Some of you might know this great line penned by Charles Dickens, but the line has much more context to it than what is often quoted. In fact, the opening line of his classic, The Tale of Two Cities, begins like this. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. There's a lot of conflict going on in that opening sentence that's just left out all the time. A more modernized or simplified view of what Dickens wrote is this. It's damned if you do and damned if you don't. And that is our, that is our Lord's lament for this day. God sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus. He preached of a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John came singing a funeral dirge, kind of like this. Die to yourself. It's in the water and in the word where you will find life. Now, who would have thought that? Uh, not only did John prepare the way for Jesus, but he also prepared the way for the baptism that Jesus would put into place in the new covenant. And that new covenant is giving to, given to us in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead to sin in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with le its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. John came along and prepared the way of the Lord, not eating and not drinking, yet the religious leaders of the day said, he has a demon. Then when the fulfillment of whom John pointed, Jesus, comes along, he came eating and drinking. And not just eating and drinking, but eating and drinking and socializing with tax collectors and sinners, the lowest of the low. Still, the religious leaders claimed Jesus was a glutton and a drunkard. It's damned if you do and damned if you don't. John the Baptist was the season of Lent walking in the flesh. In the season of Lent, we spent a lot of time highlighting our sins. John the Baptist showed people their sins and all their ugliness. No wonder people hated him. Who wants to hear that? If we were to have a choice to choose our God, our big G God, we would likely choose a God, a little G God, that would make us feel good. If our God made our demands or made any demands on us, I'm certain that somehow fulfilling those demands would be molded and manipulated into a reasonably attainable human work. After all, who wants something that's impossible to do? Oh, and while this God is at it, how could we possibly earn more money, be happier, and feel his blessing in our lives? John would scratch his head at this. His message wasn't self-affirmation, but repent. Turn from yourself and what's within you if you want salvation. For salvation isn't in you, it's in the water, where the word of God that has been made flesh, Jesus, has placed himself for sinners. We must remember this, and we must remember that John the Baptist cried out before he baptized Jesus, Look, the Lamb of God, 
who takes away the sin of the world. John came not eating or drinking. We eat and drink because we need food and water to live. So what was the point of John not eating or drinking? Well, he was preaching the law. He was showing that death lurks inside all of us. That was the point of him not eating and not drinking. John had called the religious leaders of his day a brood of vipers because the poison of death is in all of us. John's words were the poisonous venom of God's law that the brood of vipers didn't want to hear, and we don't like to hear the painful sting of those words either. If the pastor ever says to us that we shouldn't eat or drink because we're dead in sins, we'd probably think or even say out loud that our pastor maybe lost his marbles, and then we'd go digging in the text to find ways we could refute what he just said to us. It's a very humanistic approach. In all of our readings and sharing of scripture, though, have we ever found God giving us a choice to choose a God, big G or little g, that we might want? Well, I'm sorry to share this with you tonight. We absolutely will not find that choice anywhere in the accumulated text of the Bible. Surprise. God's way is his way. It's his way, or the highway, for the narrow road that leads to life. And let's face it, we don't like John the Baptist's preaching any more than anyone else. There's a reason he was in prison and killed by being beheaded. Sinners never want the law to be the law. We want God's law to be our lapdog of sorts. We want to put, on a put a collar on its neck and lead it around by a leash. For no one wants the law to kill him. No one wants the law to make him stop eating or drinking, laughing or breathing. We're no different from anyone else, and the truth of the Reformation recognizes that. Reformation weekend as that's coming up is not a reason for us to boast. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 theses, doctrinal statements on a church on the church door at Wittenberg. He wanted to debate others in the church about purgatory. The first thesis that Luther posted was this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Reformation weekend and Reformation week is not a reason to boast. It is a call to repent. John the Baptist was what some would call a bit odd, maybe even a freak, if you will, according to the standards of ancient Israel and probably would even be considered such today. The religious leaders of the day thought that he was a demon-possessed preacher. That's because he told spiritually dead people that their only hope of being saved was in the water, where Jesus, our Lamb of God, was to be baptized. We can't seem to take the rough-hewn preacher who dressed himself in uncomfortable clothes and ate locusts living off the land. We cannot take him seriously and then deny that we're not born in a sinful state of death. If, it, if we weren't born in, to death and in sin, no babies would ever die. They would only die after they did something wrong, and yet innocent infants also die, oh, just like everyone else. No wonder scripture says that we're all born dead in our trespasses and our sins. John the Baptist knew that, and that's why he pointed everyone to the water and the living word that is Jesus Christ. John came not eating or drinking, for dead men don't eat or drink. But John also preached that someone else was coming, someone who would eat and drink. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John says that Jesus must increase, yet John himself must decrease. John, while he is not eating and not drinking, must decrease. But why? It's because God wants us to bring the dead to life. So Jesus came, eating and drinking, to give us the food of eternal life. Now, that can get the damned if you do, damned if you don't crowd, acting like a brood of vipers. Jesus teaches us to eat and drink in salvation. Why not? Didn't he eat and drink with sinners? Didn't he turn the water into wine for that? Doesn't he give us his body and bread to eat and his blood and wine to drink so we sinners can be saved? Jesus' enemies called him a glutton and a drunkard. For salvation for them had become all about what they were doing for God. How can God use eating and drinking to bring salvation to us? Kind of sounds like a ridiculous question. And of, of course it does if you think salvation is dependent upon us and on what we do. 
the Charles Dickens and damned if you do, damned if you don't crowds didn't get John the Baptist or for that meter matter, they didn't get Jesus either. They didn't like the law that John preached. John unleashed full strength, high octane, 200 degree coffee that came with an extra cup of espresso in it. The kind of law that burns all the way down when you drink it. We've heard so much of it, things that were said back to John and to Jesus, things we might still hear today. You know, we're not that bad. We can get to heaven just by being a good person. Other things we might hear, babies aren't sinful. And Dr. Luther, one of his favorites, sinners have free will. They won't let the law be the law. They will shape the law into an idol at times, making it into their image and mold it into something that they can handle. But that keeps the gospel from being the gospel. Only real sinners need a real savior. A weakened law produces a weakened gospel. And if salvation depends fully on Jesus and what he did, what he said, and, and goes on giving us through his death, through his resurrection, then it doesn't depend on us. When we look at it, when we look at ourselves apart from Christ, we don't see ourselves as dead, as dead, as dead can be. We're not that sinful. And so the gospel that saves us doesn't need to make the dead alive. It only needs to kick us in the butt. The gospel only needs to give us a boost, like caffeine does. The right information so we can decide what we want to do with it. A powerless law only leaves us with a powerless gospel. Dr. Luther called us to repent on this Reformation weekend, in which we celebrate not only today, but the rest of next week as well. We do not like, deep down, or maybe not so deep down, the sting of the law. We don't want to believe that we are more helpless than a helpless baby when it comes to contributing to our salvation. But thanks to God, he still preserved a place where we can hear that truth which people scorn and despise for our life and for our salvation. In our sin, when it comes to God, we are powerless and pathetic. Admit it. Own it. That's why Jesus took our sins and made them his own. That's why he died our death. That's why he was buried underneath God's wrath for you and for me on the cross. He did that because we could not bear this on our own. That's why he is the propitiation, the perfect substitution and sacrifice for our sins. Then on that third day, he broke the seal of the tomb and he walked out alive. What does that mean? It means that Jesus now pours our heavenly, pours out heaven freely. He gives it out to sinners, even babies. It is not by grace alone, not because of anything we do. This week isn't about boasting. It's about God delivering us once more out of our damnation. God's law says we are all sinners destined for destruction. We are dead to sin, and there's nothing we can do about that. It's what we've inherited by being born in a fallen state. But the gospel says that heaven is already ours. Heaven has come to earth in Jesus. Heaven is poured out on us in holy baptism, forgiving us of our sins, bringing us into God's new covenant. And because of that, now we're alive. Because of that, we get to eat and drink with the angels, with the saints in heaven, and all the Lord's disciples who know how to eat in the presence of the bridegroom. Even John the Baptist, who abstained from eating and drinking for a time, now gathers in the eating and drinking with all the saints of God. He does that in heaven, And we do that here on earth. That's how alive the gospel makes us. We are born an enemy of God, but now God, the Holy Spirit, has brought us into the wedding feast of God's Son. For a time, John the Baptist didn't come eating and drinking, but we do. For we are baptized into Jesus, not John. John's baptism points us to Jesus' baptism. And it's Jesus' baptism that makes us alive. We are now under the gospel. The damned if you do, damned if you don't crowd will always be with us. But they too need the life that Jesus has to give. So tell all the world what it really is. Tell our friends, our families, and yes, even our enemies that they are dead in sin. But don't just stop there. Also tell them that Jesus takes our spiritual corpse and breathes life into it, giving them birth from their state of death. 
Unless someone is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We're dead in our trespasses and in our sins. But now we are alive in Jesus. Before we couldn't eat or drink or even hope for heaven. But now in Jesus, everything has changed. Now it's time to eat and drink and be merry. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Now join us in doing the Lord's Prayer. prayer. Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for all that were part of our worship at home this evening. As we conclude now, hear the blessing of our God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Have a great evening. Go in peace. Know that I love you and aloha. Thank you for joining us in our worship service today. If you are in the Pasadena, Maryland area and are looking for a church home, we would love to meet with you and give you more information on our family here at Galilee. Please give us a call here at the telephone number below. We would love to hear from you. If you are not in the Pasadena, Maryland area, but you are looking for a church home, again, please let us know so we can do our best to get you pointed in the right direction. Thank you to everyone who helped and participated during our service this weekend. We are truly blessed to have such a generous and faithful congregation devoted to sharing the word of Jesus Christ with you. And last but not least, if you enjoyed today's service, please click the like or the subscribe buttons to let us know that you enjoyed it. Please leave us comments if you so desire and sign up to receive notifications for our Saturday, our Sunday, and our Wednesday worship at home services. Have a blessed day. and God be praised. I have absolutely no knowledge of them. I just... (sighs) Paragraph four, I messed up. Okay, let's try this again. God has sent John the Baptist to prepare... Why are you up here? You can't, no, no, I love you, but you can't. Thanks. Go ahead down, Knowles. There you go. That's Look at it. that. That's it. Is that it? Unless you want to do anything else. You, yeah. want, to, you want to do any dancing or singing no. or, or <laughs> somersaults? Yeah, that's that's about it. <laughs> we, we already danced inside. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Were you nervous about this? Yes, we were. You were nervous we about were. this? Oh. I ran out yeah. copies of everything today. So she called me and said, I got copies. I said, well, good. Because I was going to ask Brad to run them off because uh. my printer's not working at home. And I said, babe, please run this off for me. And then I called him. I said, Pauline did it. He said, what are you so nervous? I said, because I don't want to mess up. Uh, <laughs>